Good morning, welcome. Uh, I'm gonna start off, thank you for being here. We have, uh, I wanna take a moment to recognize the young women from Ignite who are out here today shadowing a bunch of the, the members. Uh, so ladies, welcome today. And um, I apologize, okay. Thank everyone for joining us today. I am proud to be surrounded by my colleagues in the Women's Caucus, and I'm very proud to be the chair of, of these fearless California women. With us today, we have Assembly Member Marie Waldron, Assembly Member Eloise Reyes, Assembly Member Cecilia Aguiar Curry, Assembly Member Lorena Gonzalez Fletcher, Assembly Member Susan Talmantes Eggman, Senator Hannibal Jackson, Assembly Member Sharon Cork Silva and Assemblymember Blanca Rubio. My name is Christina Garcia and I'm proud to represent the 58th Assembly District, along with my Vice Chair, Senator Connie Lewa, who will be here shortly. Like most women, we're multitasking and <laughs> she was presenting another committee earlier. Today we are before you to release the Women's Caucus Legislative Priorities and our budget priority as we move forward. Regardless of what we do in this body, as a woman leader, as women leaders, we stand to represent and advocate for every woman in California and their access to healthcare services. The fact is providers like Planned Parenthood have given us decades of evidence that prove access to all healthcare and services, as I myself depend upon, is how to keep women healthy. While we do not have a specific ask today, we are committed to continue to fight. We will be fearless in advocating for the women in this state. The Legislative Women's Caucus Stronger California Agenda is a bipartisan and bicameral agenda with the following four pillars. Access to childcare, fair pay and job opportunity, family-friendly workplaces, and protecting vulnerable communities. In addition to having legislative priorities, the caucus has also agreed on one budget priority this year. I would like to ask Assembly Minority Floor Leader Marie Waldron to join us as we address our budget priority as our first pillar, access to childcare. Thank you, thank you. I'm grateful to be here and have your attention during the last budget cycle. It was the strength of the Legislative Women's Caucus who commanded the strongest support for childcare in the budget. We must demand the governor keep his promise to childcare providers in California. We cannot ask them to pause giving care to our youngest learners and the rates they are paid to, to not reflect the cost of doing business in the state. It is estimated that six out of seven children eligible for subsidized health care in California did not receive services from state programs. We cannot pause the reality of an 85% unmet need for California families. The Legislative Women's Caucus is united in bringing attention to the needs of our youngest learners. California is a diverse state with diverse childcare needs. We must move forward with both provider rates and childcare slots. We have asked the governor to honor our past work and commitments to the childcare workforce. Together, we need to address the reality that California's childcare system struggles to serve sufficient numbers of eligible children. Governor Brown, has referenced the achievement gap and impacts on education within our communities of color. Closing the achievement gap begins with an early care and education investment at birth. Thank you. We also have one pillar under our child care. AB 273 by our colleague Assemblywoman Aguirre Curry clarifies that engagement in English as a second language and high school or high school equivalency educational programs meet the criteria for establishing eligibility for subsidized child care programs. Writing in support, the Western Center on Law and Poverty states that it is well documented that individuals who are proficient in English have higher occupational mobility with better job prospects and the opportunity to earn higher wages. Parents are also better prepared to support their children as they enter the K-12 system. Many families require state-supported child care services in order to continue with their education and work towards a profession. We couldn't agree more and we are proud to support and prioritize AB 273. <laughs> 
Um, and I just left the Assembly Budget Subcommittee to an outline a letter that was delivered this morning to Governor Brown, a letter that addresses our priority for the coming budget, urging him to keep promises made last year and move forward uh, with slots this year. In the end, the deal that was made last year between both houses and the governor was a multi-year commitment to strengthen reins for child care providers. Governor Brown is not keeping his promise. Our letter reaffirms our commitment to childcare in the budget cycle. We develop a long-term approach so we're shoring up our fractured childcare system and we will not consider keeping his promise of modernizing childcare provider rates as progress in this budget. The promise made a year ago towards rates allowed us to use this year to increase access to childcare slots. We will accept nothing less. The last decade has been dr drastic long-lasting cuts to the system that has been chronically underfunded and underappreciated. Specifically, we need to honor the promise to increase rates to reflect the current cost of doing business in California while retaining adequate parental choice. This is not one or the other. We need to be able to do both. The governor's pause, as proposed in the governor's 2017-18 state budget, refuses delivery of modernized rates as promised. We look forward to uh, the work being done with the legislative bunch of committees, and we promise that as the Women's Caucus, we will fight for working families. Uh, with that, I want to bring up Assembly Member Susan Eggman uh, to talk about our other one of our other pillars, the fair pay and jobs opportunity, and our priority bill there. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for coming. Um, as we're all standing up here, we're remarking about how colorful we all are today. Uh, <laughs> And, and, I, and I, you know, it could be serendipity and it can be, that's just the way it is. That we hope that we bring a little bit of color and light uh, into the process. And I hopefully, that's what everybody thinks when a woman is on a job, that we bring a little color and light and we are an incredibly diverse body before you. Uh, but we all have one thing in common and that is that we know that historically uh, women have been paid less than men. Uh, and we need to stop that. And I think that's one of the things that we all stand for here now. Uh, as Ms. Garcia said, and has provided great leadership as long uh, with her uh, sub-chair, Connie Leva, and the most previous uh, chair, Hannah Beth Jackson, uh, we've been working on this issue about pay equity. Uh, we all multitask, we all do a lot of things. Uh, and it just, it just, it, it is not right that both that we don't get paid uh, equal pay for the same jobs. And it is also that women, historically women's professions have been undervalued. So if you go into teaching or nursing or social work or dietary things, places where women have traditionally been, it is, you're paid a lot less than you would be uh, for a man in a job of law enforcement or uh, a carpenter or something like that. So not only do we undervalue women in the workplace, but we undervalue the work that women do. So if somebody goes from a traditional kind of, as we think about it, women's type of employment, into say law enforcement. If, you, if they have to look at what you were paid before and then compare it to what a man has paid, you're never gonna be equal unless we kind of unwrap this package and take a new look at it. If we don't do anything, we are on track for decades not to be able to close the gender pay gap in the state of California. That is unacceptable. I have a nine-year-old daughter. It is not acceptable for me to stand up here today and know that not only is the peers of my day not being paid equally, but that her classmates, if we don't do something now, will also face the same issues that we face today. Uh, so my bill, uh, AB 168, takes a look at saying you cannot ask about somebody's previous pay in order to determine their current pay when they're applying for a new kind of job. Let people negotiate on their own. Uh, so I am proud to stand up here today with this diversity of colorful uh, people uh, who bring vibrancy to, the, to this body and hopefully vibrancy to every workplace. And I look forward to continue this work. Thank you. And joining us now, we have Assemblymember Monique Limon, Senator Tony Atkins, Assemblymember Sabrina Cervantes, and Senator Connie Leva. Good morning. I'm State Senator Hannabeth Jackson, and I'm in pink today to go with this very colorful group of very powerful women. And uh, I can tell you this is a caucus and a force to be reckoned with. Under the leadership of our chair, Christina Garcia, and our vice chair, Connie Leva, we have, an we have established an agenda that will drive forward the values that we hold dear in California. And as the immediate past chair, which my colleague, uh, Assemblymember uh, Gonzalez Fletcher, 
that's a hyphen, Gonzalez hyphen Fletcher, observed I am the uh, chair emeritus. I like that, the sound of that. <laughs> But I love the work that we've been doing, and I love the fact that last year uh, we um, uh, put into practice the strongest equal pay bill in the country, which you heard Assemblymember Eggman say we will continue to fight for in this year with that pillar dealing with continuing the fight for fair pay. One of the pillars that we have also is making the workplace more family friendly. That is critical. It is a different world that we live in today than the world when I was a child growing up. It is a world now where we need or we have more women in the workforce because they need to be in the workforce to support their families. Yet at the same time, we are calling upon, we are wanting, we are needing our species to reproduce. In other words, we want to encourage young people to have families. And yet they are working at the same time. How do we do both? So this year I have introduced SB 63. It's the New Parent Leave Act, and it is a caucus priority, uh, and uh, is the third pillar, family-friendly workplaces. Currently, 40% of California's workforce has no guarantee that their job will be there when they return from taking parental leave after the birth of a child. And when women are forced out of the job market to care for a child, this impacts their wage and career growth for years to come, and of course negatively impacts their family's economic prospects. We shouldn't force women to, d to have to choose between caring for a child or working. And we know this lack of job protected leave heavily impacts particularly low income and minority populations who tend to work for smaller employers in greater numbers. In almost half of two parent households, both parents work full time and the mother is the sole or primary breadwinner in 40% of all families with children the sole or primary breadwinner. Yet despite that, the United States continues to lag woefully, I would say embarrassingly, behind when it comes to paid parental leave. Out of nearly 200 countries in the United Nations, it's only a handful that lack paid parental leave, and among them are the great nations of New Guinea, Suriname, and of course the United States. In California, nearly two-thirds of women are employed and close to two million women, excuse me, two million households are headed by women. We know women must navigate the reality of raising our families and providing for their economic and physical security. And yet, under current law, if you work for an employer of 50 or more, you already have the right to take 12 weeks of unpaid but job-protected leave when a new child arrives. Most employees are also eligible to receive a wage replacement for half that time. So essentially, they can get six weeks of paid job-protected leave. But if you work for a smaller employer of 49 or fewer, you are not eligible for job protected leave. And you could face a story that is a situation I heard recently where a legal assistant who worked at a California law firm was told by her employer that she had to return to work six weeks after giving birth when her pregnancy disability leave ended or she would be fired. What kind of choice is this? Adequate parent, uh, parental leave is not just a quality of life issue, it's a health and an educational issue. And research shows to, uh, continues to show that the first three months of life is a critical time for a child's brain development. A critical time ch for children and a critical time for new moms. We can reduce postpartum depression by a third by giving women the opportunity to have 12 weeks of job protected leave. And that is what this bill does, not only for new moms, but we want dads to participate as well. And it also provides 12 weeks of job protected, although unpaid, parental leave for fathers as well. This is a win-win, it's time has come, and together with the Legislative Women's Caucus, I know we will continue to work to strengthen our families, their right to leave, their right for their children to bond with them. It benefits the child, the family, the employer, and the state. It's a win-win, and I thank the Women's Caucus for acknowledging and making this one of its pillars this year. 
Thank you, Senator Jackson. Good morning, ladies and enlightened men. Very happy to have all of you with us. Good morning to our friends at Planned Parenthood. We too stand with you. Uh, I'm Connie Leva. The fourth and final pillar that we wanted to discuss today is protecting vulnerable communities. As was noted earlier, the Women's Caucus felt that there was a need to expand this pillar for 2017. With the current political climate, many issues are at stake that affect vulnerable populations and women in particular, such as women living in poverty, women's health, and most importantly, women's safety. Statistics show that a staggering one in four women live in poverty. Equally staggering is one in four women experience violence from someone they know. We also know that there is much uncertainty surrounding women's health at the federal level. The Women's Caucus is committed to ensuring that our most vulnerable populations receive the help that they need to lift themselves out of poverty, yet feel safe with the families that they live with and communities, and they receive the health care that they need and deserve. This year, the Women's Caucus has identified four bills under this pillar. AB 480, authored by Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez-Fletcher, clarifies that diapers for infants and toddlers are reimbursable as a supportive service expense under existing law for CalWORKs, participating with young people in the Welfare to Work program. Des despite being critical to the health and hygiene of young children, CalFresh and WIC cannot be used to purchase diapers. However, child care providers require that parents bring a full day's worth of diapers to school with them or to preschool with them every day. Not being able to leave a toddler at childcare because of not being able to afford diapers means that the parent cannot seek and, and gain gainful employment. Clarifying that diapers are a necessary cost to participants is a small investment in the overall success of California's families participating in CalWORKs. AB 1312 also authored by Assemblywoman Gonzalez Fletcher, ensures that rape kits are not prematurely destroyed, that survivors of sexual assault are aware of their rights and the resources available to them, and codifies important additional rights for survivors such as free post-assault contraception. Last year, Governor Brown signed into law SB 813, which I authored. <coughs> this bill eliminated the statute of limitation on rape. This law is not retroactive, so offenses committed prior to when SB 813 took effect in January, January 1st of this year still have a statute of limitations. Additionally, current California code allow for a rape kit to be destroyed after only two years. AB 1312 ensures that those rape kits are not destroyed before the statute, of, um, the statute expires. AB 1386, authored by Assemblywoman Marie Waldron, launches a breast and ovarian cancer screening and awareness pilot program to promote and encourage genetic testing and screening when indicated by the United States Preventive Services Task Force and the CDC. A study published by the Journal of the American Medical Association found that women with newly diagnosed breast and ovarian cancer often don't get genetic testing and could, that could help determine an increased risk for future, harder to detect cancer, or even a chance to speak with a genetic counselor who could help them weigh in, weigh the benefits of such testing. And finally, I have authored SB 500, which would criminalize sextortion. I think it may have passed out of committee today. They're waiting for one more vote. This bill will allow law enforcement and prosecutors to pursue people that use the threat of distribution of private and sexually exp explicit pictures to demand sex, money, or even more expl explicitly sexual pictures. While California has a, re a revenge porn law on the books that criminalizes the distribution of sexually, sexually explicit images without consent, in most sexual extortion cases, there is no actual distribution, just the threat of distribution. This bill will provide the tools that law enforcement needs to prosecute the, and combat these offenses. There's still much work to do here in California, but all of us, all of the ladies you see here, are committed to doing just that. And we're very happy to be here with you today with strong bipartisan support in the caucus, and we believe that all of these bills are a good place to start. I'd like to turn it back over to the chairwoman, Christina Garcia. Thank you. Do you have materials of our bills? 
Okay, we do have materials for you uh, that are in the back that have all of our bills and our press release and our information today. Uh, actually, we'll open it up to questions. This is if they're about the budget. Myself and the vice chair could take them. If they're about a specific bill, I will have the authors directly answer your questions. That means we did a great job in explaining all of this. Um, so, I mean, I just want to reiterate that this is a bipartisan effort uh, and the Women's Caucus here, the leadership here, is going to fight not just on these issues, but on anything that affects uh, women uh, and families across the state and be the leaders uh, that we need across the nation on, on these issues today. So I want to thank all my colleagues for being here today, uh, and thank you for joining us uh, for this important press conference.